Hi, Renee with EBI Partners, and I have Don Thornton here. He's a senior trust specialist. We're here to talk about a special trust that is going to help you out, especially if you're getting bumped up to the next tax bracket and you don't know how to save money on your taxes. Welcome, Don. Well, thanks for having me, Renee. I appreciate it. Tell us about this trust. I know that I've been working with a lot of, uh, I do a lot of asset protection. I've been working mm -hmm. with a lot of HVAC companies lately, and we use some online marketing strategies. It's really, uh, the income has bumped them to the next tax bracket. Uh -huh. And they were sitting there with their hands up, like, what do I do? What do I do? Instead of giving all this money to the IRS, what can I do? So I thought you'd have some some answers for these HVAC. Products. I would. And I would say that conservatively speaking, in the last six weeks, I've talked to probably 200 uh, people, a lot of people with different, you know, all different kinds of industries. Uh, but the the uh, common thread is they're not W-2 employees and they're all upset and worried about taxes. Right. And so, you know, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people saying, well, what's the point of working hard and making more money if it's just going to bump me up on my tax bracket and then i don't net i don't net as and so what I, i'm not getting i'm not getting a financial reward for doing all that hard work and so it's the that, consequence right we use a lot of these online marketing strategies and it really is bringing in some some additional income mm -hmm. and that's it it's going directly to the irs so the solution is has been kind of the one-two punch that we've been looking for yeah i mean i'm, I'm a perfect example because I'm a real estate investor. I've been specializing in short sales for 20 years. And I can tell you that most of the time, I mean, I'm not bragging, just being honest, being transparent, you know, uh, 500, $800,000 has pretty much been in my wheelhouse for a long time. And very rarely did I have or ever have a year where I wasn't writing a check to the IRS. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had an S corporation. And for me, because I don't, uh, hold anything long term. I don't have investment properties. For me, I'm just flipping. So that means that the, the money that I make comes in as active ordinary income. Okay. So that's can get expensive. So give an example. If you make below $165,000 in a year with if that's ordinary income, you're being taxed at 24%. 24, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you go above $165,000, then you're up to 32%. I was going to say that's 32, right? Yeah. Which is a big jump, right? So think about it, right? You're, I mean, it doesn't seem that much if it's $100,000. Okay, well, you pay a little bit more. You, you said $24,000, you're paying $32,000. You get a $200,000 at $32,000 is now up to like over sixty, dollars right? And so that is really frightening for a lot of people because think about that. You're at $100,000 a year. You're paying approximately $24,000 in taxes, okay? If you work hard and you get out there and you use strategies to bring in more revenue, wonderful, we applaud you. IRS is gonna go, okay, you you jumped up the tax bracket. So now if you make $200,000, you're gonna pay $60,000. So it's a $40,000 jump in your taxes just by by being you know a great entrepreneur and increasing your revenue and, and you know, people think they're being more profitable, but listen, if you're paying taxes, that's expense. That's not mm -hmm. profit, right? right. And then oh, most there's... people will say, they'll say, well, I can just, I can just deduct it. I can just, you know, create some deductions. What right, is your we're talking about? We're talking about net income here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've already deducted what you can. And here's the, here's the, the challenge that a lot of people have, especially people who do have 1099 income consultants, uh, direct, you know, sales, commission sales, uh, when they're being paid a 1099, they don't have many expenses. The 1099 people are the ones who are getting really screwed because mm -hmm. they have no write-offs. I, I can't tell you how many times I hear that. I don't have a write-off. Mm -hmm. What can I write off? I can't write off anything. And so it's like, yeah, you're right. You, you can't and you won't. <laughs> so, you know, they, they, they feel the, the force. Hey, look, I'm a real estate investor. Like I said, I can write off almost anything and I have. And I tell you, it gets you so far, but you get out of control with that. It's Russian roulette. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be careful because you're going to get audited. And if you right. can't prove every single thing was legit and you're in trouble. So I suppose that's I one of the things that was really enjoyable to me about this tax strategy that you've been talking about is, is the protection, the 100% lawsuit well, protection, asset protection, yes. but also the protection from being audited. Let's yeah. talk about that a little further. 
Well, um, we have a, a accounting firm that's, that has been servicing trust clients for over 30 years. And I talked to the CPA uh, in the summer and, and I asked him, I said, well, how many have you done? He says, well, I lost track after 10,000 returns. Okay. A lot of, a lot of returns, a lot of clients, a lot of years. And he said, Don, I have ne I've never had one of my clients be audited by the IRS. Maybe 20 times in 30 years, they've asked for clarification about a few things. We provided the information and they said, okay, thank you. And that's it. They have ne they've never been audited because this trust, this tax strategy is in perfect compliance with IRS code 643. So this tax, this particular tax code was spe specifically written into it for trusts. And why is that? Because the ultra wealthy have been using this trust for, for as long as the United States has been in existence, even before that. So when the tax code was implemented in the 1930s, voila, 643 came into effect. And now, you know, when you use this trust, this trust, not other trusts that they can't do this with, this trust with this uh, strategy in compliance with IRS code 643, everything is completely transparent, legal, no problems. So say you own a coffee shop or a vitamin shop, something like that, and you are looking for a bit of tax relief. How does this work for somebody like that? Well, I mean, listen, I don't know if it would be worth it if you're making like below $100,000. I mean, I suppose you can, but it, it's not, you don't get a lot of bang for your buck. I find that the sweet spot for a lot of people is 180, 200,000 or more. And so once they're bumping up into that, 32% tax bracket. Yes. When you get about that's when it starts to, that's when it starts to hurt. Okay. So let me give an example. Okay. So I, I was uh, talking with a, a woman who's moving to from W2 into her own consulting business. And she's very excited about it. She says, I know I'm going to make a lot of money. I already have contacts. I already have people that are ready for me to start. And I said, well, how much you think you're going to make a year? And she goes, I think I says, I'm being conservative. I believe that I'll make $200,000 in my consulting next year. And I said, that is amazing. But let me just, I said, I just want to uh, correct you here. You're not going to make $200,000. She goes, what do you mean? You're going to make about one hundred and forty, dollars maybe one hundred and thirty-eight dollars is what you're going to clear. She goes, what do you mean? I said, you're going to get hit and tax it. I told her, 32%. You know, just do the math, right? $320,000 times two, that's $64,000, right? So that's mm -hmm. $130,000. She's only going to make, you know, she's only going to clear, you know, $134,000. And she said, oh, my gosh, why? And I, I said, I've explained to her, you're a 1099 employee, uh, subcontractor. You have no write-offs. And the IR, this is active income. And it, it, the entire amount that comes in, your net income is going to be going to be torched at, 30, at 32%. And so I walked her through how to, how to set the trust up, how to make sure she's the trustee, how she has 100% uh, you know, um, uh, discretion and power to manage the, the trust for the benefit for the sake of the beneficiaries. And I told her that what you want to do is you can set up an LLC to run your business. They don't pay you directly. They pay your LLC. And I said, with this strategy, we can move $194,000 of that 200,000 into the trust, which will be passive income for the trust and any taxes owed will be deferred in perpetuity. Meanwhile, your LLC is only going to have a net income of six thousand dollars. Well, you're not going to pay any taxes on that, right? LLC is not. It's not going to happen. So, and the hundred ninety-four thousand dollars is now on the trust, in corpus of the trust. You're the trustee, so you you manage that. And there's so many more uh, things you can pay for as a trust expense you can't do uh, as a write-off with a with an S corp or a, or a um, LLC. So I didn't get, you know, I mean, I'm not getting the details right now about how that works. I'm just saying that this is, that shows you how powerful it is. So she goes from projected um, tax burden of sixty-four thousand right. dollars to not paying anything. Powerful. Right. That's this is because powerful. of the way, because of the specific five pillars of the way, this trust, correct? Yeah, it's a non-grantor, irrevocable, complex, discretionary, spendthrift trust. Now, non-grantor means that you cannot set it up yourself and be trustee because the IRS will give you zero tax advantages on that because you, they're going to consider it to be an alter ego of yourself. It has to be irrevocable. That means that any assets 
that are going to be in the trust, personal and business, they have to be sold to the trust irrevocably. So they become the trust property. You can't use the trust as a holding pin where you can pull stuff in and out. That doesn't work. Again, you got to be in compliance with the IRS rules. So discretion, you know, discretionary part of it means that as trustee, like I said, I mentioned before, you have full authority and responsibility to manage the assets on the behalf of your beneficiaries. But basically you control everything. But there's one more part of the discretionary pillar that is very important. When the money, the passive income is coming in from your LLC, mm -hmm. that, that passive income can be declared an extraordinary dividend by the trustee. So you have the discretion to declare that an extra, that, that income to be an extraordinary dividend. And because of you know, IRS code 643, subpart A, B, C, and D. What is IRS code 643B? The Spendthrift Trust and IRS code 643B. I tell you what, this is a union which creates massive, massive legal tax reduction. But before I get into all of that, let me do my disclaimer to tell you that I'm not a licensed tax or legal advisor. I don't give tax, legal, or accounting advice, and this material has been prepared for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for tax, legal, or accounting advice. You should consult your own tax, legal, and accounting advisors before engaging in any financial transaction. All right, so who am I? My name is Don Thornton. I'm a 20-year real estate investor. I'm also a senior trust specialist. I've been a small business owner most of my adult life, and I also own this trust. My business, HB Funding, Inc., has been the anchor of my success the last 20 years, and I'm very proud of the fact that it has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau since 2004. I flipped well over 3,000 short sales in 20 years. I'm one of the leading short sale investors in the country, Don the short sale guy. Uh, so I'm very proud of this because, you know what, I built my business on integrity and I bring that to this, to this trust business. So let's talk about the benefits of a spendthrift trust. Well, the, the big four, I call it the Mount Rushmore of benefits, is that it gives you 100% lawsuit proof asset protection. Capital gains taxes are not a taxable event if you're selling a trust asset. Any kind of passive income that comes in the trust is also not a taxable event, and it can help convert active income to passive income if it's paired up with an LLC, for example. And the biggest thing about this trust that makes it so valuable and so unique is that it is an IRS Code 643 compliant trust. So you might be asking yourself, well, hey, what does IRC Code 643 be cover? Well, it covers a lot of things, but amongst them all, it covers trust, income, and distributions. So let's just dive in and talk right now about capital gains tax and the trust. Now, I'm going to quote right here from IRS Code 643B. I'm going to read this in its entirety because it's very important that you understand this. Gains from the sale or exchange of capital assets shall be excluded to the extent that such gains are allocated to corpus and are not a paid, credited, or required to be distributed to any beneficiary during the taxable year, or b paid, permanently set aside, or to be used for the purposes specified in Section 642C. So basically, what this is saying is that there's no tax, there's no um, capital gains tax uh, as long as the gains are allocated to corpus and are not distributed to any beneficiary. So you're probably thinking to yourself, what the hell does corpus of the trust mean, Don? Well, it's a Latin term, corpus. It means body. And so in this sense, what we're saying is, is that as long as the gains from any capital gains uh, tax, or excuse me, sale of capital gains, that they are allocated to the corpus of the trust, meaning they become trust property, and they are not distributed to the um beneficiaries. Now, this is something that's interesting here. I own a trust, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just have a quick comparison here. I'm going to show you that the language in our trust is exactly the same as in Internal Revenue Code 643. Now, look at this right here, okay? So, in the bottom left-hand corner, you have what I just read. 
Gains from the sale or exchange of capital assets shall be excluded to the extent that such gains are allocated to corpus and are not a paid, credited, or required to be distributed to any beneficiary during the taxable year or be paid um, permanently set aside or to be used for the purposes specified in, our, in Section 642C. So look what it says here. The trustee shall and is obligated to do so and is bound by his or her fiduciary responsibility to allocate all gains from the sale or exchange of capital assets to the corpus of the trust because all such gains shall be excluded because such gains shall be allocated to corpus and under no circumstances be, shall be paid, creditor, or required to be distributed to any beneficiary during taxable year or be paid permanently set aside or to be used for purposes specified in Section 642 of the IRC. Do you see is the exact same language? Telling you this is an IRC, IRC 643B compliant trust. So I'm telling you guys, as a real estate investor, as a business owner, get ready, get used to a new reality when it comes to your tax reduction strategies. Because listen, capital gains, sale of capital for profit, it's not a taxable event for this trust. And again, the 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 money quote here is that. Gains from the sale or exchange of capital assets shall be excluded to the extent that such gains are allocated to corpus and are not paid, credited, or required to be distributed to any beneficiary. So think about this. Real estate investment properties. If you have a business and you're selling that, crypto, stocks, precious metals, Forex, no capital gains taxes will be owed if, you, if they are a trust asset when you sell them. OK, that's pretty powerful. But let's talk about passive income in the trust, because that's also a huge you know, source of income for the trust. And we, I'm going to show you now how that's also not going to be a taxable event. So let's just go and review here about the benefits of a spendthrift trust. We are you know, we're not going to talk about asset protection in this video. We are um, <clears throat> we already covered the capital gains. But right here, passive income, not a taxable event. We're going to cover that right now. So here's how it works. Passive income comes into the trust. After the trustee declares that all that passive income is going to be an extraordinary dividend for the trust, that means zero taxes are going to be owed. And I know I can hear you in my, in my head right now. Don, what is an extraordinary dividend? Well, we're going to go back to the tax code. We're going to go back to 643B. Talking about income, it says, for purposes of this subpart and subparts B, C, and D, the term income, when not preceded by the words taxable, distributable net, undistributed net, or gross, means the amount of income of the estate or trust for the taxable year determined under the terms of the governing instrument and applicable local law. Items of gross income constituting extraordinary dividends or taxable stock dividends, which the fiduciary acting in good faith, determines to be allocable to corpus under the terms of the governing instrument and applicable local law, shall not be considered income. So who's the fiduciary? Well, that's easy. That's you. You're the trustee. That's what it means. The, tr the, fidu the trustee has fiduciary responsibility for the trust. So fiduciary equals trustee. So you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, that sounds great. It's a little bit mumbo jumbo because we're quoting from a tax code. So how does this work? Well, it's easy. Passive income comes into the tax into the trust throughout the tax year. So it could be from rents, it could be from you know lease payments, it could be from passive investments. If you have as long as it's coming into the trust as passive income, your accountant is going to prepare your taxes. This 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 trust files a 1041 every single year. So like you would for an LLC or an S Corp, you know, you're going to go through, you're going to be doing your QuickBooks, you're going to be uh, giving this to your accountant, your accountant is going to be uh, going to deduct all the trust expenses. Finally, you're going to be left with an amount that normally would be taxable income if you were, you know, talking about an S Corp or an LLC, but with you as trustee, whatever is left over that after deductions have been taken, you are going to declare that to be an extraordinary dividend for the trust. And so by doing that, your passive income now becomes a non-taxable event. Pretty cool, huh? So I'm sure there's naysayers out there. You're out there, you know, saying, Don, how in the world is this possible? How does the IRS 
allow this. This something something doesn't something's not right here. Well, if we're going to go back into this and look at this closely, more closely on, on 643 in the tax code, but IRS code 643 allows the governing instrument, which is the trust, an applicable local law to determine the amount of income for the tax year. Let's go back and look at this, okay? Highlighted in yellow, under the terms of the governing instrument and applicable local law, the, the uh, fiduciary acting in good faith determines to be allocable to the corpus and under the terms of the governing instrument and applicable local law shall not be considered income. Okay, so you see here twice in this one paragraph, the tax code refers to um, the taxable year, the income for the taxable year is, is determined by the terms of the governing instrument, which is the trust. Okay, it's very important. So it's not the Internal Revenue Code that is determining what the trust has as taxable income. It comes from the actual trust document itself, the government instrument. And I'm going to repeat again, the amount of income of the trust for the taxable year determined under the terms and governing of the governing instrument and applicable local law. So the trustee allocates all the passive income to corpus of the trust. And then these items of gross uh, income constituting extraordinary dividends, which the fiduciary or the trustee determines to be allocable under the terms of the governing instrument and applicable local law shall not be considered income. OK, so key takeaway from here is that the amount of income of the trust for the taxable year is determined by the terms of the governing instrument, the trust and local law. This is commonly referred to as trust accounting income. Now, I want you guys to understand this, okay? The Internal Revenue Code does not determine trust accounting income. It, the trust itself determines that, okay? So listen, we, we, you know, it's not just me saying this. You know, we have a, a former IRS expert. Um, he was a, a senior revenue agent, agent with the Department of Treasury, responsible for the examination of corporate tax returns, real estate investing trusts, high-income individuals and related taxable entities, and the accurate application of tax laws and related procedures created by Congress of the United States. This is what he concludes. Title 26, subtitle A, chapter 1, subchapter 1, part 1, subpart A, section 643. Definitions applicable to subparts A, B, C, and D clearly define and outline that gains from the sale or exchange of capital assets shall be excluded to the extent that such gains are allocable, allocated to the corpus of the trust and are not required by the governing instrument, the trust itself, to be distributed to the beneficiaries. It further outlines that extraordinary dividends and taxable stock dividends are excluded as items of gross income constituting extraordinary dividends and ta or taxable stock dividends, whereas the trustee acting in terms and conditions of the trust in compliance with all applicable local laws and the trustee acting in good faith determines that such dividends are allocable to the corpus of the trust under the terms of the governing instrument and applicable local law shall not be considered income. Okay, it's a former IRS agent saying this right here just to back this up, but it's right there in the tax code. I've already read you the tax code, okay? So what this conclusion is, is that any gains from sale of capital assets excluded, not a taxable event. When, you, when the trustee declares that this income is uh, an extraordinary dividend for the trust, it is not considered income. If something's not income, it's not taxable. They only tax on income, okay? Now listen, this law firm that I work with um, you know, we were licensed with them, has created this trust for clients for almost 50 years. Something like 79,000 clients have this, have, have had this, um, uh, trust 50 years of tax returns minimum. Okay. As far as we can tell, no, not one audit and not one issue with the IRS, not one of this, of this firm's law clients have ever come back and had any kind of issue with the IRS, much less an audit. Okay. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, why has there been no pushback from the, IR, from the IRS all this time? You know what? Occam's razor. It's the, simplest, the simplest explanation tends to be true, okay? 
This is a legal strategy. That's why there's been no pushback, because no laws are being broken. This trust is written in full compliance with IRS Code 643B. The tax returns that we filed disclose this. We have been fully transparent with the IRS for decades. And like I said, as far as we know, not a single audit or problem in 50 years. So I want to congratulate you that you found this trust that's going to protect your assets and your wealth for generations. And listen, plus, as I've already shown here, your tax burdens will be significantly reduced thanks to this trust being 100% compliant with IRS Code 643B. Okay, back to passive income and extraordinary dividends. Well, then it's not a taxable event as long as the money stays in the cor- in the corpus of the trust. Now, if you disperse it, you're going to pay money. You're going to pay taxes on whatever you disperse. That's why you want to keep it in the trust, and you know that way that 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 uh, money is not going to get taxed. The whole idea of this strategy, using the trust, using this using this strategy, is to limit or eliminate any taxable events. Right. Correct. So let me ask you a question, Renee. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are you taxed on? What does the IRS tax you on? Well, uh, just about everything. Uh, in, in my world, I'm still. Uh, well, I'm not talking about you specifically. Just in general, mm-hmm. what is the, what is? You know, There's a very common misperception here. Mm-hmm. People think that you're taxed on your income. You are not. You're taxed on taxable events. Oh. Okay. I understand. I understand. So we, this strategy has no taxable events, none. And it's perfectly sure. legal because it's, it's, it's in accordance with the IRS's own. People often ask me when I'm walking through this, this tax strategy, well, then how do I run my business? How do I get paid? How do I pay my bills? And I like your answer to this. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very simple. The, the, the trust can pay for Anything, if your if your trust assets, I mean, excuse me, if your business assets are sold into the trust and you are running your business through an LLC and you're leasing the business assets uh, into the LLC from the trust and you're making the trust a 90% limited partner or a member in your LLC, right. okay, then uh, it, the, the trust is obligated to pay for any expenses that have to do with your assets, OK, so let's say if you have um, if you're an HVAC company, right, then mm-hmm. your your trucks, your equipment, your machinery, your tools, every single thing that is going to be sold in there to the trust. And that's going to be a trust asset. So that means that anything having to do with your business at all, but it is a trust expense. So I'll give you an example. If you got if you HVAC company, you have a van, you go out to, to places you, you're not you know, you're not you can't deduct gas. You can deduct some mileage. But you can't deduct gas. If you go to Jiffy Lube and you get your oil changed and you get your tires rotated, that is not a, that is not a write offable. You can't write that off expense. Okay, it is with the trust. So everything having to do with that is is you know, you can uh, it's a trust expense. Now even that, that that applies to personal that expenses as well. So if you sell your primary residence to the trust, same thing. Your mortgage, your uh, insurance. Uh, if the water heater breaks and you got to call a plumber, trust pays for it. Everything there, you want to put a new roof on, trust pays for it. I get a lot of questions on this, so I'm glad you walked through that because people are concerned. And they also are concerned if they have a vehicle or a home that mm-hmm. has been sold to the trust, how mm-hmm. can they sell it? The trust sells it. Mm-hmm. It's just like you sell it normally. The only difference is that you sign the title, you're going to sign it as trustee of the trust mm-hmm. when you when you sell the when you sell the property, the the um, vehicle and let's talk about the capital gains associated i mean if you have um okay you know, a real so, estate investor like we are um you know well, you're buying a lot of properties okay well there's i find that capital gains generally falls under three headings you have investment properties for in real estate side when business owners sell their businesses oh, or yes. crypto crypto right? mm-hmm. crypto those are really the three biggest ones that i that i talk to all right mm-hmm. so uh Investment property. It's not your primary residence. You hold your, your, it's a buy and hold situation. You're renting it out and you decide at some point that you want to sell it. So when you do that, when you, at the sale, then you are obligated to pay capital gains taxes. Now the biggest, the, the most famous um, strategy to avoid paying capital gains when you sell an investment property is you're going to buy another property 
and put that money there and you have a 90 day window to decide what property that is. And you have six months to, to close. And try to do that in a market like we were just experiencing. Yeah, yeah. good luck, right? right? Yeah, that, that's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. So, but that's the only strategy that most people know about. Well, in with this trust, is it, if it's a trust property, and the trust sells it, you know, signs a contract, it closes, the money comes in. That 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 those tax that is not that is not a taxable event. Those capital gains taxes will not be paid because they're inside the trust. As long as you keep them inside the corpus of the trust, you don't disperse. OK, now business owners, same thing. You're going to get hit with capital gains. Now, um, if you're selling your business, meaning you're selling your business. Yeah. So I have a I have a client that came to me because he was selling his business for mm -hmm. like seven million dollars. I think he was on a hook for like one point seven million dollars for capital gains. And we talked about this. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, it's uh, people with that kind of money. They're, they're going to be very about doing their due diligence and so forth but uh, it took us about a month but then you know bottom line was he didn't pay anything no capital gains so that one imagine what you could do as a as a business owner when you have instead of cutting that check for 1.7 million dollars the irs that's in your trust account and you can do whatever you want with it provided that it's in it's a trust expense and you can you know buy another business that's the market you want to, you can do that and that's the beauty of it. So, um, you know, it, it's so capital gains there as well. Crypto, mm -hmm. same thing. I mean, you know, you're getting caught uh, with capital gains on crypto when you're when you're uh, when you sell it. So you do the same thing. You put the crypto into your wallet. And your wallet is then put into the trust as, a, as an asset. And then whatever happens, you're never going to pay capital gains on that. It's going to be permanently it's going to be permanently deferred. And by the way, I need to, I need to, uh, I forgot to do this at the beginning. I just want to put a disclaimer out there. Okay. Yeah. I am, this is all for informational purposes only. I am not a licensed tax advisor. I'm not a licensed attorney. I don't claim to be. Like I said, this is for informational purposes only. And I urge you before doing any financial transactions to consult with a licensed uh, tax Absolutely. authority. Okay. So having said that, uh, I do know about trust and I do know a lot of this stuff. So, you know, this, take this information in and of course do your due diligence and including, you know, with licensed professionals to make sure that you're okay before you make any decisions. But I can tell you just from my own experience about what my clients have, have had great success with. I have a client that she's in Chicago and she has a, has a W-2 job, but she also has a side business that makes about $800,000 a year cosmetics, you know. How does that work with both the W-2 and the 1099? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why she... Uh, she bothers with W-2. I guess she likes it, but she's certainly made enough money to be on her own. And, you know, we can't help her with the W-2. No. But we can help her with the business. So that's what we did. We we uh, worked it out to where she, um, you know, we, she bought the trust and then she sold the business assets to her personally. And then she sold them to the trust. And now when you sell, when you do this, this uh, strategy, the trust is not giving you money. The trust is going to give you a what they call a demand note, or it's like a promissory note without interest. So let's say, for example, that I'm going to sell my uh, primary residence to the trust, so it becomes a trust asset. And I say, let's say that it's five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so then the the trust will give me a demand note for five hundred thousand dollars, which I can draw against whenever I need something that the trust cannot provide. So we, we call the three F's food, fashion, and fun. Right. So if I, you know, if I, I want to go down to, uh, I don't know, let's go, go to the grocery store and buy a month's worth of groceries or whatever, you know, I can't, I can't charge it to the trust, but what I can do is say, okay, uh, I'm going to budget a thousand dollars a month for food. Let's say, okay. So they'll say, okay, well, I want to do something else. Let's say I maybe need to buy the kids school clothes. Uh, maybe I need to buy myself a suit or whatever. So I figure out what I'm going to do. And let's say, okay, I'm going to pull out $8,000. Okay. So what happens then is that um, I would draw $8,000 from that $500,000 note, which is going to reduce it down to $492,000. So it just reduces it down. And the, the $8,000 that I take out is not a taxable event. So that's how I get my cash. So that's, that's, that's how you do that. So anyway, when getting back to the house, 
So once that's in there, then the trust pays for everything having to do with that asset. And then when, you know, now you wouldn't get capital gains for a primary residence, but if it was an investment property, right, right, right. you would. And because tr- it's a trust property, then you're not going to pay capital gains because it's going to stay in the corpus of the trust. And according to IRS code 643, there's no capital gains event, tax event. So that's that's the beauty of this of this system. It's so, I mean, it's funny that I often get two types of reactions. It's too good to be true, and it can't be that simple. Mm-hmm. I, I yeah. get it too, and I even advising a lot of those that have uh, that are on the. W two classification, just advising them to talk to their human resources department to see if they can make a switch to yeah. yeah, so that they yeah. can reap the benefits. Yeah, some can, mm-hmm. you know. So it just depends on what you want to do. So uh, the, the strategy itself is is pretty much flawless. And uh, I, at this point in time, I don't know why anybody would would want to to do other stuff. I mean, I hear if you go on the asset protection side. You hear a lot about people that will set up a trust, I mean, not a trust, an LLC in Wyoming, and they'll have like a, a whole mer- you know, labyrinth of LLCs, right, to try to protect stuff. And, eat. and listen, you're painting through the nose to those financial advisors and those attorneys that are setting this stuff up. And it's all designed to make sure they, don't, they can't get sued or someone sues them and they have to go through so much trouble to get to them that it would be not worth their while. But any attorney that is determined, can crack that can crack that uh, that labyrinth of LLCs. So you, you, it's a lo- I would call it illusory illusory protection because of the spendthrift provision in this trust. It's practically impenetrable. The only way that the government or the, or the attorneys or you know people who want to sue for whatever reason, only way they can crack it is if they can show that there was fraud being being done by the trust or criminal activity, but normal business, law abiding citizen, following all the rules and so forth. If somebody decides, I mean, listen, there's so many people out there that I read about this woman in, she's an attorney in San Francisco. She was suing everybody. She was filing like 10, 15 lawsuits a month because she was banking on people settling just to make it go away. Okay. So you get a lot of people. I mean, I, I was talking to a restaurant owner this summer and I said, from a legal point of view, what is your what is your biggest concern? She said, slip and falls. I mean, you can drive down. I was I, I, I'm sorry I didn't go back and, and take a picture, but, you know, I was driving down a road recently and I saw the big billboard slip and fall. And that's a big industry. Right. With this trust, Dude. with the spin for provision. You know, it cannot be sued. Now, you could anybody can file a lawsuit. I'm not saying you can't file a lawsuit, right. but when the judge is informed that this, this that the property is an is an asset of a spendthrift trust with a spendthrift provision, they'll toss it because it's they, it can't be sued, right? And so, you know, I had a I had a situation like that. Uh, I'm not going to big detail on it, but it was a situation where there was a discrepancy on price and and uh, the buyer wanted to sue and say no you know it was a situation where we thought it was going to be an equity deal and then it turned to be a short sale because the payoff came in to thirty thousand dollars more than what anybody expected okay. he said no 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 that's my price and i'm not doing a short sale and you owe it to me you know and it's like well you know it got it got pretty serious and uh you know well and i said it's fine go ahead but just just to let you know full, full transparency you know i don't know this is a this is an offense of trust and they walked away i never heard of them again Right, and if if it was brought to court, what happens? The judge would pause it. And why is that? Because it has a spin through provision, and because it's been through provision with this trust, which is based on contract law, not legislative law. Contract then, law. Uh, it can't be. It can't be uh, sued. Mm-hmm. I mean, this the the asset protection is so strong that it can stop an imminent domain lawsuit in its track. Yes, I would really like to cover that. I've been talking about this fact with a lot of real estate investors, and they don't believe that this could be true. They're still having a hard time wrapping their head around the, the capital gains uh, being deferred into perpetuity. And um, this just blew their mind. Let's talk about it. Well, uh, out West, especially, you see a lot of this in the domain stuff, but it happens here in Florida too. I had a, um, back in 2005, I believe, I, I was talking with a, uh, a realtor that was involved in my short sale business. And she, I think they had three Beefle Brady franchises. And she said they were in a big lawsuit with the county because the county was going to put a road in. And they told her that they had, she had to sell. And the offer was not market value. 
and she had because they couldn't do it because she she said like even domain is like a, a bulldozer you can't you can sue but you know they, they they're going to get you well the trust if you put if they had if they had sold the asset those assets into the trust okay and if if it was um you know the, the building the land everything in there and so forth and they could have told you know told the uh, county federal whatever whatever government entity is trying to do him in the domain they could not, they would have to go around it literally they'd have to go around it or you could use that as leverage to get the price that you want so i mean it's like it's like the it's like the uh, i don't know if you ever saw the the this the you ever heard of dido that that british chick uh, the, the singer a band yeah mm -hmm. what yeah, yeah anyway she did a uh, um she did a song where her her video was she was in a, in a metropolitan area with skyscrapers everywhere, and she had a small house that everybody built around, right? And so I, I think about that all the time in this scenario because literally that's what you can do. I mean, you can you can be an oasis, you know, in a desert of growth, right? Industrial growth, progress, whatever you want to call it, road building. They cannot move you unless you want to be moved. And so what I tell people is if this, if this if you have an LLC, can you stop in the domain? No. This trust can. So if it's that powerful with them in a domain, imagine how powerful it can be against a, a slip and fall lawsuit or a predatory lawsuit. It's you know? true. We've got a couple that. minutes left and I just want to wrap things up. Is, is sure. there any other industry or any other, what, what are the some frequently asked questions that you get? I, I covered all the ones, uh, you know, the slip and fall, asset protection, uh, eminent mm -hmm. domain and capital gains, um, yeah. we deferred into perpetuity. Uh, what else is the most enticing part aspect of this of this five pillar spin thrift trust? I would say it's 50-50, The asset protection that's that's the that's the foundation because uh, you have to build you have to build your business and your income your revenue on a solid foundation that can't be taken away from you unless you mess up yourself. Right. Uh, and then the other thing is is that once that foundation is built then you can use the amazing tax reduction strategies that are perfectly legal, like I said. Mm -hmm. And I just, I keep repeating, IRS Code 643, trust, this trust especially, mm -hmm. is set up for this tax code in perfect compliance. And, you know, I would say, don't let your preconceived notions, you know, prevent you from thinking or accepting the fact that, mm -hmm. This is this does work. And I just like to I'd like to leave you with one quote. Warren Buffett famously said, My secretary pays more taxes than I do. And I show that video all the time. It's one of my favorite quotes. It is. Why do you think it is? Because the rich have rigged the system since the beginning of the tax code, and this is how they rig it. Well, now it's available to you if you are open enough to explore it and see if it works for you. So I would say. Two hundred thousand dollars. You're above one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars, and you're, you're getting ordinary income. Whether you're a business owner or you're a salesperson or ten ninety-nine, then you're you're foolish not to do this. Realtors, anybody in, yeah. in the, the sales force world, mm -hmm. it's yeah. worth exploring. Uh, yeah. Down at the bottom, uh, assetprotection.now.site. A s s e t t a s s e t protection at now.site this is where you're going to get some additional information there's tons of webinars that we have put together for you guys mm -hmm. if you have specific questions we want you to give us a call uh the phone number is there the website is completely open you don't have to put any information in there you can just watch every single one of these webinars to learn a little bit more see how it specifically is tailored to your business and then give us a call we want to we want to help you lower your tax obligation well, so thank you. For having me. I appreciate it. It's been, it's you been answered great. a lot of questions. I keep getting more and more questions the more we discuss this. So I'm really glad that uh, we were able to connect today. So thanks for thanks for having me.